Hello, um, Fáilte Ruf Galeer. You're all very welcome to this, which is the last webinar in this series, um, which has been examining a life course perspective on living with COVID-19. Um, the Centre for Economic and Social Research on Dementia is really delighted to bring together um, a great lineup of four speakers uh, who are considering and going to discuss national and international perspectives on services and supports for people with dementia living at home uh, and their families. A number of issues are considered, including rurality, technology um, and mental health supports that are needed to enable people with dementia to really live well at home. And they'll be considered in this next hour. Um, I think these are all really highly relevant issues for the dementia care system in Ireland. And I hope you'll find the presentations really informative and stimulating. We're going to begin with Fiona Foley. Uh, who's going to describe the Understand Together programme. Um, and that's going to provide us with some context for the changes in the approach to dementia that have occurred in Ireland since the publication of the National Dementia Strategy in 2014. Now, Fiona um, worked as a manager in Germany for 10 years and she followed her Irish roots uh, to move to Ireland in 2009. Uh, she was appointed to establish the charity CL Bleu, and that's a charity that promotes and provides uh, physical activities for older adults and those with chronic diseases. She then took on a role with the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. And in 2018, she was seconded to the Health Service Executive, uh, which is the health service here in Ireland, to develop a framework for the Dementia Understand Together in Communities programme. And she's held the role as National Coordinator for Dementia Understand Together since then. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Fiona to join us today. Hello, Fiona. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and welcome to everybody else today as well who's joining this webinar. It's fantastic to be here. Um, as Fiona said, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Dementia Understand Together campaign, which is a HSE-led campaign, but very much a collaborative approach. We partner with the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, with Age Friendly Ireland, and with over 40 different partner organizations as well. Um, as Fiona mentioned, um, the campaign is part of the National Dementia Strategy. So it is one of the six elements of the strategy, which you can see on the next slide. And it is to raise awareness and understanding. Now, we started off with extensive research um, on this to look at what are the issues um, in Ireland that we have to tackle? And it comes as no surprise that there was uh, stigma and, um, on dementia in Ireland. And as you can see on the next slides are some of the key findings of the research. Um, the research is a quantitative research and it was also conducted with focus groups with people with dementia and their carers. And they are very much at the heart of this campaign throughout from the development to the implementation phases as well. So as you can see, um, some of the research findings there. So we took that research and we developed the um, objectives for our campaign. And you'll see that the objectives are to build awareness and understanding. But at the same time, we really want to inspire individuals, businesses, service providers to take actions to support people with dementia in our communities. We started off with a TV campaign and radio campaign where people with dementia spoke about their own personal experiences. And after two years, again, we conducted some research and we saw that there was quite an improvement on awareness and understanding. But national campaigns like that are not enough to actually really change a culture around dementia in our country. So culture change is something else. It's a culture is the way we think about dementia, we act and we interact with people with dementia. So how do we achieve a culture change, that is something that we can only do through people. And it's people uh, coming together, showing certain behaviors and inspiring each other with these behaviors to, to have um, and implement outcomes in our communities. And what are the outcomes in our communities? You can see that from feedback with people with dementia and their families, it was that people are understood and respected and valued, that they can stay socially connected and engaged in community life if they wish to do so, that local businesses and amenities are responsive to a person's needs, and that the built environment is accessible. It comes as no surprise that these are things that are important to all of us as well. And so it's not necessarily when we talk about creating inclusive communities for people with dementia, that it doesn't mean we're creating communities for everybody out there. 
And how do we go about that? So if you imagine yourself being one of these little dots on the slides and you show a positive action, a positive behavior to support a person with dementia, a person who trusts you will follow those behaviors. And so we just inspire people around us through our behaviors to, to, to create that real culture change. So what are the actions that we're asking people to take? And you can see those six actions on the next slide. And these are actions, again, that people with dementia told us will make a huge difference to them. And you can see they're very simple actions. They are that we see the person and not the dementia, that we talk about dementia, that we stay in touch with a person, that we ask how we can help, that we support somebody to keep up their hobbies and interests, and that we make sure that our services and spaces are easy to use. But as I said from the start, this is a collaborative approach, so we cannot do this alone. So you'll see on the next slide that we have over 40 national partner organizations supporting us on this. And they all are taking actions to make their organizations more inclusive, such as training. Um, but they also review their services and look at, is the services actually accessible? Um, can people access the parks? Can they access the stores? Um, and how can staff members support them in doing that? In addition to that, we have about 350 local community champions. And these champions are just people like you and I who've contacted our campaign and said, we'd like to do something for, for people with dementia. And we want to create an inclusive community. So they're linking in with those national partner organizations. They're speaking about dementia in their local community. They're holding awareness talks. Um, and so they're supporting people also to make their services, spaces, and also community groups accessible for people with dementia. Because it's not always about creating new services. It's also looking at what are the existing services that we have and how can we make them accessible for everybody in our community. Now, what you can find with all of this, um, all of these actions people are taking, storytelling is a really key element of the campaign, because if we don't talk about our behaviors and if we don't talk about the actions we're taking, we cannot inspire people. And stories are the most powerful way for us to connect to people. And this is where technology comes in a little bit as well, I think, because we can all use the technologies that we have at the moment to share the stories that we have. And we do that through social media, to local and national media, um, to let people know what is actually happening in our, uh, through our partner organizations and in the local communities. So you'll see a few examples here in the next slide as well, where um, Irish Rail, for example, um, held dementia training for their staff members, but they also had focus groups with people with dementia walking through, the, through their stations. Also, the GAA Museum now is dementia inclusive. Tipperary is working towards making uh, Tipperary inclusive. So all of these things are things we have to share and we have to tell people about them so that we know and that we can start ins inspiring others to follow suit as well. And how do we stay connected? So I think the next image is very familiar to everybody as well. It is through Zoom, through other um, webinar tools that we have, where we can link in with our partner organizations, we can link in with our champions, and we link in with people with dementia who join focus groups and give us their feedback on what um, actually works for them in their communities and what is positive in their communities as well. In addition to that, we have numerous resources. Uh, we have a website, it's a one-stop website. Um, and on the website, you can see the service finder, but you can also see several documents as well that can be downloaded free of charge. There are tip sheets, there are banners, there are badges, um, and you'll see all those on the next slide as well. And there are different um, infographics and presentations as well that people can download, they can use those if they want to hold awareness talks in their own uh, communities. There are inspirational videos too. And what we also offer is online training for communities, but also for those organizations out there as well. So if we can just have a look at the last slide here, um, because as I said from the start, research is really important to the campaign. And again, we conducted some research to see actually how our partner organizations and our wider community champion network are getting on with their actions in their communities. It was really inspiring to see that despite COVID, that the majority of our community champions and national partners were still taking actions for dementia. So they were still holding awareness trainings. They were reaching out by phone to people with dementia and they were staying in touch and looking at how can they use this time to actually 
make their services better. But we also asked them whether they felt that all of these actions had already changed awareness and understanding from their own perspective. And they felt the majority of national partners, over 81%, felt that in their own organization and wider networks, they had already increased awareness and understanding. And community champions, 86% felt that in their organizations and wider networks, they had increased awareness and understanding. So this is a fantastic step in order to actually start creating inclusive communities. And we always invite everybody to come together, to get involved, to contact us, um, and to start working on little actions that we can all take to make our communities dementia inclusive. Thank you very much. That's fantastic, um, Fiona. Thanks very much for that. Um, I, I think the, the little kind of social network diagram was really fascinating to see, um, sort of showing our interconnectedness in that graphical way. I think COVID-19 has brought that home to us in a terrible way in the sense of, you know, the infection spreading and so on. Uh, I like to think of it now, and, and particularly in this context, as um, as kind of good story spreading and good behaviours and good attitudes and the importance of us modelling and uh, those attitudes and behaviours and telling uh, good stories uh, about dementia. That's really great to hear about. Um, I should say for our participants, um, we're going to have a Q&A at, at the end. Hopefully we'll have some time for that. Uh, so please feel free to post your questions um, and we'll take them at the end. I want to move on and introduce um, our next speaker, who is Dr. Joanne Fegan. I, Joanne, actually, can I stop you there? Joanne seems to be having connection problems. Maybe okay. we should move on to the next speaker and come back to her. Okay, yeah. That's this would be Julie. Julie's slides. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will introduce uh, Julie then. I hope Julie's available as well. Um, Julie. Uh, Kostanuk is um, delighted to say joining us from Canada today. It's it's uh, ten fifteen, I think, in in Canada. And Julie is a research associate with the Canadian Centre for Health and Safety in Agriculture at the University of Saskatchewan. And um, she's a member of the Rural Dementia Action Research Team, uh, and they focus on improving the delivery of healthcare services for people living with dementia and their families in rural and remote communities. Um, I think we in Ireland think we have issues with rurality and remoteness, but I think they're of a whole other order in Saskatchewan in terms of the, the, the vast distances involved. So I'm delighted to, uh, Julie's able to join us today and she's going to talk about navigating remote and rural dementia care in the future lessons from Canada. Over to you, Julie. Oh, thanks very much, Fiona, and great to be here. Um, today, I'll be talking about the collaboration between our research team and primary health care teams in Saskatchewan to implement rural memory clinics. And this research is led by Dr. Deborah Morgan, also at the University of Saskatchewan. So looking at rural Canada and Saskatchewan, just to give some context, in Canada, about 17% of the population lives rural, so outside of cities of 10,000 or more. And that's about 6 million people. And of those, about 20% are older adults. And there are uh, an estimated just over 600,000 people living with dementia in Canada. And looking at the province of Saskatchewan, we tend to be more rural than Canada um, as a whole. And we have about one third living in rural areas. And of those, about 18% are, are older adults. And we have an estimated just over 20,000 people living with dementia. And looking at rural challenges and strengths, uh, Canada's first national dementia strategy was released uh, two years ago, and it cited several barriers to uh, rural care. In rural areas, of course, tend to be uh, people tend to be more uh, geographically and socially isolated, and social isolation is one of the main risk factors for dementia. Uh, specialists are not easily accessible. And in Saskatchewan, this can mean traveling up to several hours to see a specialist in one of the two major cities. Uh, health and social services also tend to be more limited to, to the more basic services, where the specialized services are concentrated in, in, um, in cities. And public transportation options also tend to be more limited, um, which means relying on friends and families 
for, um, for rides. And this again, reduces access and increases isolation. At the same time, there are a number of uh, strengths in rural areas. So there uh, can be opportunities for older adults to be very involved in their communities, which reduces isolation. And there are fewer healthcare providers, but th this can mean easier communication between healthcare providers and more familiarity with patients and families. And looking now, um, the specialist clinic, uh, rural remote memory clinic, was um, established as a way to increase access by the radar team in 2004. And it's located at the University of Saskatchewan right on the campus. And it started as a research demonstration project and now it's funded by the provincial government. So the mandate of the clinic is to diagnose and manage uh, rural or remote patients with complex atypical dementia. But the clinic often receives referrals for less complex uh, cases such as Alzheimer's disease. And partly for this reason, we began focusing on primary care as a way to build capacity um, in rural communities. So the rural primary health care model for dementia, uh, we began partnering with uh, a health region in Southeast Saskatchewan that's primarily rural. And we established a steering group in 2013 that still meets every three months. We also conducted a regional needs assessment uh, and we found um, several challenges in rural primary care uh, in terms of accessing decision support tools recognizing and diagnosing people with dementia and um, offering team-based care to people with dementia. So we developed a rural primary health care model and it was informed by the literature that found that the best outcomes um, for people living with dementia were coordinated and comprehensive care. So we took these elements, there were seven of them, and if you look at the figure, um, these are grouped into um, three sort of domains or gears. Um, these are interprofessional care, decision support tools, and specialist to provider support. And I will go through each one of these in just a moment. So looking at the rural memory clinic teams, um, we began working uh, closely with the Kipling primary healthcare team, which is uh, just pictured in the top left. Uh, it's a community of just over 1,000 uh, people in Southeast Saskatchewan. And we began working with them to implement and refine this model, which became a one day memory clinic. And we now work with four primary healthcare teams um, in Southeast Saskatchewan. And we have adapted this format to fit each team because each team has a different configuration of healthcare providers. And it also has, they also have different resources in their communities. So looking now at interprofessional care, um, each team holds a memory clinic one day a month or every two months, uh, depending on the need in the, in the community and surrounding area. And in the last year, um, the clinics have been less frequent because of COVID. And if we can just show this quick video clip, it's 90 seconds and it shows a typical appointment with the Kipling uh, memory clinic team clinic today and we're going to see an 85 year old female. So we initially meet as a team before the patient comes in and family and talk about the concerns that we know of. Then the family and the patient come in and we discuss with them any of their concerns and then each team member will either take the family or the patient with them. So initially we start with a neurological assessment by the practitioner then they will go on to see the home care nurse who does some cognitive assessing, like how to spell world backwards. Perfect. Then they will go on to see the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist, and they do quite extensive testing. During that time, the family will meet with our first link coordinator from the Alzheimer's Society, talk about their concerns without having that family member there because some things are very sensitive to them. I felt that I was included right from day one. This team is absolutely wonderful. Uh, the difference that they have made with mom being allowed to stay at home uh, living safely. Balance testing that we did indicated that she's at risk of a fall. So once all those things are done, we come up with a plan for that patient and or family. The 
Great. And looking now at decision support tools, which is just, I believe, two slides back. And uh, these decision support tools that the teams use are based on the primary care dementia assessment and treatment algorithm, uh, which was developed by Dr. Dallas Seitz at the University of Calgary. And these tools have been embedded as flow sheets into the team's electronic medical records. And uh, PC data is informed by Canadian guidelines for dementia. And these help to guide the patient assessments um, and they have a separate section for each of the healthcare providers. And looking at specialist to provider support, when a new team joins the project, they first take part in an education session with the PC data developer. And then we offer continuing education webinars to all of the primary healthcare teams three to four times a year. And the topics are identified typically by the teams themselves. And then we find an expert to provide the webinar. And then we also offer remote specialist support through telephone consultation with geriatricians in, in our city of Saskatoon. And then of course the rural and remote specialist memory clinic um, also offers remote diagnosis and remote interventions. And then just to wrap up, um, I'll mention that we have a number of projects, uh, research projects underway linked to the memory clinics. Um, some of them are on hold now due to COVID. And then Dr. Deborah Morgan um, has published a few papers that are available on our website, looking at the development and implementation of the rural memory clinics and some barriers and facilitators. And then as far as next steps, we continue um, to focus on spreading spreading this one day memory clinic model to other rural primary health care teams. And thanks very much for your time. Um, that's a really interesting uh, presentation, Julie, um, particularly here in Ireland where we're in the process of developing a dementia model of care, um, which is going to uh, create a kind of a, a, a system of, of clinics for uh, the diagnosis of dementia, which we're uh, which we need to improve on, I think, here in Ireland. Um, so there's a lot of learning there, I think, for for the practice that's that's underway here and the projects that are underway. Um, I'm going to um, move on now to introduce um, our next speaker. Um, and I suppose while technology has been a part of the response to people with dementia for some time, um, the past year has definitely accelerated the use of technologies in all sorts of settings. So this uh, next presentation is particularly relevant. Professor Arlene Asta, I'm delighted to welcome Arlene today. And she's director of the Dementia Aging Technology Engagement Lab at the University of Toronto. And she's a full professor of neurocognitive diseases at the University of Reading in UK, uh, where I believe she's joining us from today. She's also a senior scientist at Samsung AI Center, where she leads the Wellbeing Lab. And Arlene has more than 20 years of experience in developing and evaluating interventions to support people uh, to age as well as possible, including those li living with dementia. And we're really looking forward to hearing from Arlene today. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry, no, I thought it was. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, thank you for that introduction. I'm delighted to be here. And I hope that um, what I'm gonna say follows on nicely from Julie. Um, in that I'm gonna talk about how you can use technology uh, to live a good life with dementia. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a few initiatives. The first one on the next slide, uh, sorry, the next slide is actually the collaborators who've contributed to this, uh, both in Canada and in the UK. And I will be giving you links at the end to our website for the date lab where you can find some of the resources I'm going to mention. So first of all, uh, on the next slide, I'd like to talk, tell you about day to day. And day to day, um, Cormac, do you mind like pressing the thing for me because it's got animations? Um, sorry, day to day is uh, an app for people who have just been diagnosed with dementia. And we're currently working with local memory services. So when people receive a diagnosis, they um, can be offered the opportunity to have day to day, or I should say we were before COVID, um, it's on pause at the moment. But the idea is that um, you can 
keep track of how you're doing in terms of your cognition. You can see at the bottom the modules, nutrition, mood, activity. Also, you can set up reminders, uh, which are on the, in the middle. It has a speaking clock. And the idea is that you, you keep track of these things and it helps you to see how you're doing. But if we go to, um, uh, but also you can share this with family. Ah, this is it. Thank you. You can see all the features here. So keep pressing. Okay. And I would say if you keep pressing, I will just explain that all of this was based on research that is has been done over a number of years uh, with older adults in their own homes to collect these data. So we've got validated modules about collecting dietary information, cognition, mood, and physical activity at home. So, so if you carry on going through this, and I'll get you to the um, clinician portal. So this is just showing all the research it's based on. So we also work to co-create with the clinical team a portal for them. Um, and again, hopefully the features will come up if someone presses the, the, the cursor. Um, but this allows them to get messages, to look in on the, sorry, the different um, areas, and they can look at patterns. You can see that display. And we created all of this with the clinical team to find a very glanceable, easy to read, um, uh, messaging that they could then follow up if they notice something of concern. So that's something for the post-diagnostic period for people to, to track how they're doing. If we go into the next one, I'd like to tell you about Circa, which is very close to my heart. This is something I've been working on for 20 years, my first technology project, and we're still going. Um, and it's basically was uh, developed to promote conversation and communication. And you can see some of the scenarios there. It can be one-to-one -one at home. It can be in a, in a, a care setting, like a day center, a long-term care, a hospital. Um, and also it can be done remotely um, now because uh, we have an online version. Um, if you'd like to press the thing, it will show you the original publication of this back in 2004. So we've been plugging away at the idea of digital interventions for people with dementia if you'd um on the next slide what you'll see is some data from a study that was funded by the um horizon 2020 program where we looked at uh people uh, using circa in a group setting so we had 143 people um and they uh, we did this twice a week for four weeks and we we showed some um benefits to both their cognition but also their quality of life and for those of you who work with people in long-term care, you'll know that having um, engaging activities is really, really important. And so we were very happy with these results. And on the next slide, you can see um, that we also um, found that this was um, still there after 12 weeks, after we'd finished, after we'd basically left the care home. Um, but what we did do was we did leave them with the technology to run the groups themselves. And what we found was that in fact, people kept improving, which I think was fantastic. And we think that that's probably down to the, the staff having the time to spend and also knowing more about people. So it kept that positive interactions going. So I was very happy about, about that. Um, and you can find that um, in this paper, which should come up now. Uh, hello. Yeah. So this has been published and um you know, I'm happy to take any questions about this system. So if we go into the next one, um, you'll recognize some of these. You probably play solitaire. Uh, you might uh, see in the bottom corner there a jigsaw puzzle. And the one with the bubbles you might not be familiar with, but it's a game called Bubble Explode. And since um, tablets became available back about 10 years ago, we've been also exploring the availability and accessibility of apps that you can just download from an app store or the game store and and finding ones that are particularly suited for people with living with dementia so if you um if we go on from here we've done a lot of research on this if you'd like to just keep pressing we can just go through these i just want you to know that this is all evidence-based so if you want to introduce any of these sorry if you go back click back one click thank you we have a website called the ACTO Dementia website. And ACTO comes from Accessible Touchscreens. This was created in partnership with people living with dementia and they wanted the word dementia in the title so they could search for it and know that it is a resource for them. And if you go there, you can find our recommendations. I have somebody working in my lab who posts a new game every other week. 
Um, and she also hosts a uh, every other Friday. The next one is tomorrow. She hosts a workshop for people to come and learn how to um, find the accessible apps, load them and use them with people who are living with dementia. It could be a relative. It could be someone you care for uh, in the workplace. Um, but it's open to everyone. It's at 10 a.m. in Toronto. So it's 3 p.m. In, in Ireland and the UK. So I'll, I'll have the, the links again at the end, but we definitely encourage you to, to come and look and search for games and also post queries if there's a game you're looking for. So the final thing I want to talk to you about um, is another use of technology. And here we see somebody playing a bowling game. You can see she's bowling it down the, the aisle. Perfect, a strike. Now, this is a group activity, and as you can see, it's not something we're doing at the moment because it's in person. But the reason I want to tell you about this is this has been an important project that we've been working with for about five years, and the, the technology we use is, is an Xbox Connect. And basically, we've set up these groups um, in, in about four or five organizations now, and a bit like with Circa and a bit like with the tablets, we, we try to go in, we train the staff when, we, when we're doing our research so that when we leave, they can carry on holding these groups. And the Connect Bowling Group in all of the centers we've worked with, it's now part of their regular programming. It's on twice a week. People come to the bowling group. And what is great about it, and again, we have published some of this, but what is really interesting is it's social, it's cognitively um, engaging, it's uh, physically active and it's just a fun thing to do and also it tackles a lot of negative perceptions a lot of stigma about people with dementia not being able to learn new things do new activities we have we've you know looked at people at all different levels of cognitive challenge and they can still learn to play they can enjoy the game so all of my work with technology is really about challenging the negative perceptions about what people with dementia can do and showing how off the shelf available technology can bring them pleasure, enjoyment, either playing a game on their own, doing things with other people. Um, you know, this stuff is available and I really encourage you to, to seek it out. I think if we go to the last, the next slide, um, sorry, this is just showing what I just said, that they improved. If you understand p-values, basically, we showed that they, they learned, they improved. And this was a really big impact for us to challenge those perceptions. So if we go to the next slide, what you can see here is this is the web page of the lab. Uh, it's called the Dementia Aging Technology Lab. If you look, this is the front page. You can see at the top about our um, tablet workshops. If you go to any of the other tabs like resources, you can find the manuals that we we use for things like the bowling. We also have a, a, manuals for setting up tablets. Um, if you go to uh, send us a message, um, one of my team will respond, um, help you to find appropriate resources. Um, and hopefully, oh, that's a bit whistle stop. I hope you've got some ideas there or you feel encouraged to try some technologies. And definitely if you, you know, if you're available, come to one of our workshops. Juanita is um, amazing at delivering these. So thank you very much. I think my last slide is just all my links. Um, you can always, you know, connect me through, connect me through any of these. And my Twitter handle is positive aging because that's what we're all about. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Arlene. Um, yes, a lot of a lot of information there in in yeah. and well done on on as you say a, a whistle stop tour. I think it's really fascinating the way um, you've been using, as you say, kind of off the shelf technologies to almost you know enhance and and um, uh, and improve the experience uh, for people with dementia instead of just replacing you know using technology as a kind of a replacement for the human interface. It's, it, the human interface was was important there and it kind of enhanced. And what was going on. Um, I want to introduce our final speaker and um, as I said please send in some some questions. I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll have we'll have time to consider them at the end which would be great. Um, and that's Joanne Fegan. Jo uh, Dr Joanne Fegan uh, works as a doctor in mental health care here in Ireland in, in the west of Ireland and she specializes in delivering mental health care to the over 65s. 
She's currently in year six of an eight year training program, uh, going on to become a consultant psychiatrist in, in 2023. Um, Joanne is going to speak to us today about maintaining people with dementia in their own homes um, for as long as possible. And uh, she's going to share some of the work they do in the, the mental health services. Thanks very much, Joanne. Thank you very much, Fiona, for that introduction. So um, hopefully the main overall aim I have this afternoon is to give people um, an appreciation of what uh, Psychiatry of Later Life team do in um, maintaining people at home with dementia. So just to go through, through some of my minor aims, so to give a brief outline of the sources of care for a person living with dementia in the community, to briefly describe how mental health care works in general, and then to differentiate that from how mental health care of over 65s is delivered. I want to summarise referral pathways and the types of referrals that we receive as a Psychiatry of Later Life team from those with dementia and to summarise some of the reasons people with dementia go to long term residential care. And finally, then to just specifically outline what our role as a Psychiatry of Later Life team is um, in preventing and delaying admission to long term care. So on my next slide there, you'll see a little diagram that has the domains of care for people living with dementia at home. And you can see you have family, you have home supports, and you have medical supports. And you can see that they all overlap. Family still would carry the bulk of the care burden, I suppose, and um, the, the bulk of the, the support for the person living at home. Home supports then might take the form of things like home help from the HSC, you can access sitter services from voluntary agencies. So that would be someone who would come and sit with a person with dementia, have a conversation with them, play cards with them. So it's less about personal care and more about social interaction. And then medical care would take the form of uh, primary care, which is our usual GP. The vast majority of that would be visit to the GP surgery. You can have acute hospital admissions, um, you can have referral to secondary special, specialist service from the GP. So that'd be, for instance, a trip to the cardiology outpatient department or neurology. So moving on then to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about how mental health care is delivered in general. So unlike general medical care, mental health care focuses much more on community based care. Now, we would always at any given time have a certain number of inpatients, but that would be the minority of the caseload. So the, the impetus, the um, direction of care is always towards the community. It's always a multidisciplinary approach. So you have on any given community mental health team. So there it is in, in the, the title of the team community. Um, multidisciplinary, you'd have your nurses, your doctors, social workers. Um, you'd also have occupational therapists, psychologists. So in a fully staffed, in the ideal world, in a fully staffed team, that's, that's what you'd have. So as I said, the main emphasis is on delivering care in the community. In a general adult team, the form that that would take would be mostly outpatient clinics where the person would come and see the person in clinic so they'd see the doctor. Then you would also have home and nursing home visits from the community mental health nurse. So there would typically be a key worker assigned to a given person. And then less frequently, you'd have home and nursing home visits from doctors. So as I said, the aim is always to keep inpatient admissions as infrequent and as short as possible to empower the person. So then how does Psychiatry of Later Life team then, how do we differ in our delivery of care? So first off, we have a much, much higher threshold for admission to the acute psychiatric inpatient setting. And we have a number of reasons for that. First of all, elderly people are much more inclined to be institutionalized. So they get used to having the care around them 24 seven. Now that can happen to anybody. They can find it a shock to the system going home even after a short admission, but particularly so with elderly people. Also, they're more inclined to pick up infections in an inpatient setting or they could have a fall. Uh, a much higher proportion of our community work then is conducted via home visits. So basically we bring the care to the patient. So in a general adult team, the patient comes to the outpatient clinic in a psychiatry later life team, we bring the care to the patient. We also have a much higher degree of shared care with other medical specialties. So in particular, geriatric medicine and neurology. And that would be because elderly people would have more medical conditions. 
Liaising with family then is a critical part of the assessment, the treatment and discharge of all of our patients, but of course, um, particularly so in those with dementia. We would also then do uh, provide a consultation service in the general hospital setting. Now, a lot of hospitals around the country would have what's called a liaison psychiatry team, but there's only one hospital in the country that has one that's specialising in those over the age of 65. So then what you would find around the country on occasion is a community team in psychiatry of later life would provide some support then to the liaison psychiatry team. So then moving on to the kinds of referrals that we get um, or how the people are referred and the kinds of referrals. So at least 95% of the referrals that come to a psychiatry of later life team come from the patient's GP. And these are usually prompted by concerns from the family. The remainder then would be from a medical team as part of the discharge plan from an acute hospital, or these would be people who might be followed up on the caseload. So if we saw somebody as a consult in hospital, we might follow up, follow up then afterwards in the community. So what kinds of referrals do we get then? If we move on to the next slide there, please, Cormac. Um, so the biggest thing I see on the referral letters coming into us are sleep disturbance. Um, so a person is up at night, they might be sleeping a bit more during the day, but they can be wandering at night, which obviously puts them at risk. Agitation and or aggression is another common one. Some of the psychiatric issues we would see then would be anxiety, depression, Sometimes the person has paranoid symptoms. A common one would be in dementia in particular, a common one would be a fear that people are stealing their clothes or stealing money from them. Visual hallucinations would be associated with particular types of dementia and morbid jealousy then is something that we would see from time to time as well. Occasionally, a person would be referred to us with anxiety or depression and we would do a cognitive screen as part of our core workup. And we would often come across then um, a cognitive impairment there. So we would frequently find ourselves in the position of making the diagnosis of dementia. OK, so um, how does a person with dementia find themselves then in long term residential care? So one of the common scenarios I've seen is unfortunately someone who might be living at home, no family support. They had been managing somehow, then they will have a fall or they'll develop a chest infection and they'll end up going into hospital and then they just don't recover their baseline functioning and end up going to long-term care then because they would need more support at home they can't manage anymore. Another scenario then is where you'd have somebody that does have family support in place but there's a sudden change in the care needs for the person so either their dementia advances suddenly to such a degree or their physical needs become just too overwhelming for the family to manage at home. Another issue we see from time to time then would be deteriorating physical health or the death of a family member who was the main carer. And then sometimes there is difficulty accessing home supports, so not enough hours of home help or not the right type of support. So not everybody needs help with washing and dressing. Some people just need conversation. They just need um, social interaction, but home health service have a very specific remit that's handed down to them. OK, so um, what do we do then as a psychiatry of later life team? So like other community mental health teams, we also have a multidisciplinary approach and we apply that to dementia in the same way that we apply it to any other presentation that we see coming into us. So from a medical perspective, what that's about is obviously we assess the person, we talk to the family, we do the cognitive screen, and then we look at what medications might help. So the kind of things you'd be looking at is making sure that there's no underlying depression or anxiety and you prescribe medication to treat that. Sometimes you're prescribing medication to help restore the sleep-wake cycle. And sometimes then it's helping to treat some of the aggression or agitation. Now, we would prescribe what we call cognitive enhancers as well. And what they tend to do is slow the progression of the dementia and it can keep a person maintaining some particular baseline before they deteriorate further. So it delays the deterioration. Nursing support then is a huge part of what we do. So this would be made up of home visits to the person 
and really what the what the community mental health nurse is doing in that instance is they're visiting the person themselves checking for the effect of medication to make sure that it's working that it's not causing any intolerable side effects but we would repeatedly hear from family members that the nursing visits are a huge support to them, that it's somebody for them to talk to as well. So it's not just the person themselves, the patient themselves, it's also the family members. Occupational therapy then would have a huge role around safety assessments in the home, looking at activities of daily living, looking at meaningful occupation, and sometimes they'd get involved in anxiety management as well. Our social workers then, um, so if we move on to the next slide there, our social workers then would take a look at um, home care packages. So they might help the person with the application forms that help the family with that and direct them towards the right places. There might be some issue around financial supports, accommodation, um, sometimes as well, they provide counselling and support to family members and our particular team, and I know that a number of other Psychiatry of Later Life teams around the country operate a dementia information group. And this would be just providing practical tips to the family around, they might have some issues around legal issues, for instance, enduring power of attorney, how would they go about that, those, those kinds of things. And finally, then we have psychology as well. Our senior clinical psychologist would um, provide some psychoeducation to family and to the person themselves and helping them to come to terms with the diagnosis. And then very often they would conduct specialised neuropsychiatric assessments to um, diagnose the dementia. So I'm just going to run through two quick case studies just to give you to, to bring it to life and to give you a practical example of um, interventions that worked in real life cases. So my first one here is a 75 year old widowed gentleman who was referred to us with personality changes and reversal of a sleep wake cycle, which was causing huge stress to his daughter who was living with him and she was the main carer. The day before we were due to see him, he had a medical admission for a urinary infection and the medical team requested our input as he was quite agitated on the ward and they had begun the process of applying for long term care. So we liaised then with the medical team. We prescribed medication to treat his agitation and to help out with his sleep. We, work, we had our social worker involved to look at home care package. Our clinical psychologist as well did detailed neuropsychiatric assessments and we um, diagnosed this gentleman with frontotemporal dementia. So if you move on to the next slide there, Cormac. So I'm delighted to say that the outcome for this man is that he does remain at home and his daughter is relieved and delighted with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the second case then, if we move on, uh, is a 71 year old lady. She had an established diagnosis of dementia when she came to us living alone. Her married daughter lived close by, but had two children of her own and was working full time. And this lady was referred to us because she was having sleep disruption and an increase in irritability. So basically what we did with this lady was we treated her underlying depression. We got some home supports in place to support her daughter and to support this lady herself. And again, I'm delighted to say that she remains at home as well. Um, she had some initial resistance to home care because she's very physically fit and active. But once she got used to it, um, she's she's delighted now. And this lady brings her out for walks and plays cards with her. So it's more social intervention. So on to my final slide then, um, just in summary. Um, so just um, when you're looking at maintaining a person at home with dementia, it's all about collaboration. So as a team, what we need to do is we collaborate with the person first and foremost, with their family, with GP, with other agencies and with other medical specialties. We have immediate emergency measures to maintain the safety of the person themselves and the others around them. And then as quickly as possible, we need to do something about carer stress. So thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much for that, uh, Joanne. Very um, comprehensive kind of overview of the, the kinds of uh, services and supports and interventions provided uh, by the mental health team, Psychiatry of Later Life team. Um, I haven't seen any questions come in, but so you still have a chance to post some. But I'm going to invite um, all our speakers back on. We'll have a, a panel with um, an opportunity maybe to just... Uh, consider some of the common issues um, that you've all raised um, in the course of the, of the presentations. Um, I suppose 
one of the um one of the issues there is is the importance of of kind of connection of involving different disciplines um and uh you know of of, of coming together um and technology has obviously helped service to do that in in covid-19 um because it's 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 enabled um you know people to do that virtually um what challenges has that posed though or, or how well has that worked and what have the gaps been in terms of 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 technology stepping in 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 covid-19 i know julie you mentioned some modifications and 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 joanne and arlene might have have, have some lessons to share as well julie do you want to start with that uh, well, I know that one of the one of the issues that the specialist rural and remote memory clinic has had um, is just uh, familiarity with technology uh, among older adults and the need to really train um, offer some training initially um, to to help them become comfortable with the technology and and so that's one of the I think major major issues um, and so you run the risk of um, during a time like this of leaving some people out of being able to take part in that technology if they if they don't feel comfortable really yeah i was thinking about that arlene and 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 the the touch um screen stuff i know just personal experience with my own parents that you know the smartphone swiping and touch screen can be can be tricky sometimes is that how was that overcome <laughs> Yes, and that's why we started um, a program before the pandemic. It was called Let's Connect, and it was basically running sessions for care staff, volunteers, families, and people with dementia to come and learn how to use tablets particularly, um, because tablets are a bit bigger screens. Smartphones can be a bit fiddly, especially as well if you have dexterity problems. Um, and then with the pandemic that's why we've moved online to have this um online workshop and it doesn't assume any knowledge at all but it is to try and get people to feel comfortable and so the for instance the apps that we we recommend for accessibility that's the point that the the movements that you need are very simple intuitive you don't need to do lots of complicated things like zooming in and out and this and that and the other and we tell people how to set those up because that is really important. You can't just hand someone a tablet and go, "Hey, there's, there you go." It's no way. <laughs> it's there's a you know, and that's where we're trying to distill that knowledge for people to to find out how to do it and feel their way um, and get comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And Joanne, do you see a role for technology um, or or the kind of enhancing technology that that um, Arlene talked about uh, in the kind of services that? are provided by your t the team you work with? Certainly I would do, yeah. Um, there's all sorts of, I've been recommending a couple of mindfulness apps to some of the patients that I've been working with. Now they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't necessarily be cognitively impaired. One of the issues I've come across with technology is just living in a very rural area here in the west of Ireland is infrastructure. So the actual broadband in homes might not necessarily be mm -hmm. up to what's needed to make sure that it flows nice yeah. and easy and to, to kind of remove that as an obstacle. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, Fiona, to bring, to bring you in, I, I think I know um, there's a kind of an intergenerational aspect to understand together and, and the work that's going on in communities. Um, do, you, do you think that that has a role to play in maybe kind of bringing on the, the use of technology uh, and as a resource to train people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that whole topic of upskilling people um, has been very, uh, very much in, in our concern as well this year. And um, there were different initiatives before COVID-19 when it comes to intergenerational intergener learning between school kids, transition year students and older adults and engaging in that format. And I think it is really a vital uh, way of engagement as well. And not just for the use of technology, but also just to um, to learn from one another and to to um, increase that interaction in general. And there are quite a few uh, projects at the moment when it comes to raising awareness for dementia um, amongst transition year students. And we're using technology to do that, um, rolling out online training um, as well, and then looking at the things of how they can interact. Um, I think also what we've seen is that um, even though there might've been initial hurdles of 
you know, older adults or people with dementia um, using technology that they really learned, uh, learned very quickly as well, just like we had to adapt and learn as well. And it is about how can we make sure that people um, feel empowered and can stay connected. And I think technology has also been a really good opportunity to connect, especially as you mentioned with rural Ireland as well, to connect people to join social clubs, to join Alzheimer cafes, and um, to join focus groups that might not have been able to travel to go to these kind of initiatives. So it actually also has helped some people to stay connected. Yeah, and and I have a question um, from from Robin uh, Webster about. So we've been talking about um, um, people with dementia, but but I think you know a lot of what all of you have been saying is really applicable to the general aging population. Um, you know, wh what are the implications for the kind of work that you've been doing for for the general population? Um, say Arlene and maybe maybe Julie uh, in terms of the primary care model. Yeah, well, I mean, the pandemic has highlighted the problems with um, isolation and uh, loneliness um, among older people. And as we were saying earlier, I mean, this it's sort of been a bit double-edged because it's pushed people towards technology, which I think is great. Uh, although, as you said, there's infrastructure problems in many areas and accessibility and cost and so on. Um, but I do think... Um, I think what we'll see going forward is a sort of hybrid model of in-person um, uh, groups and, and activities resuming, which you know is really important for that social connectivity and interaction. But for people who are remote, being able to join um, and participate in things, and of course now we can participate in things on all over the world. So we could go yeah. for a, a tour around the Guggenheim Museum or sit in a concert in you know Paris or something. Um, and I think people have become much more aware of what is available. And I do think services will start to look to incorporating that more into their offering so that it's so much more available for people and also, you know, tackling some of that loneliness and isolation. Yeah, yeah. And and Julie, the model that was used for the memory clinics in the primary healthcare settings, and we're just we're coming to the end of our time, uh, in the primary healthcare settings, was is that something that's used for other um, disorders and not just dementia? Is it applicable, more widely applicable? Oh, I think it, would, it definitely would be more widely applicable. Um, and, um, you know, moving forward, that is that is something that we could possibly be looking at. Um, certainly more of an interdisciplinary model for for the general older adult uh, population. And it works particularly well in rural communities when you do have a number of different um, sort of sectors working together, like um, therapies, occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, home care and social work, um, especially home care because they're, they're often in rural communities, um, you know, some of the first people to see um, issues in terms of in terms of people with cognitive uh, problems, and then they're able to bring that to to the family physician or the nurse practitioner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're running. We're coming to. We're really running to the end here. So um, I'm going to take the opportunity to, unless you have any issues and any of you want to to raise before I I wrap, but. Um, I really would like to thank you all um, for taking part today. Um, I think it's been really um, a nice kind of compact um, takeaway for, for people to learn more about what's available in terms of technology, how off the shelf technologies can really potentially enhance um, people's lives and the evidence that's there for that. Um, I think the adaptations or the, the models that can be developed in primary care are really important um, to hear. Um, for, for Ireland, it's, it's certainly something that I think there's a lot we can learn from that and, and you know, how taking that systematic approach to having the decision support tools, the links into the specialists and so on can really bring that kind of specialism out to a much more, much wider population who find it hard to access. Um, and then obviously the importance uh, has been emphasized throughout of multidisciplinary working um, in primary care, in mental health care, uh, with, with technology, uh, what it can add, and, and also then bringing in the community. So it's been a really, I think, complimentary um, set of presentations. And uh, thanks very much for sharing them with us. And I hope everybody who has, uh, 
joined in has has got something from today. Um, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I close it up there. Thank you.